Well, hello again, my friends. I'm Nate Rakowitz, and this is your podcast uh, of the week, uh, Fuse Bites. Uh, it's a podcast that this year is focused on AI readiness in companies. Uh, you hear about AI everywhere you go. Uh, it's at every conference that you're at. It's in the news everywhere. It's been an explosion of interest since ChatGPT burst onto the scenes uh, about a year and a half ago. And here we are, you know, talking about AI within companies and how difficult is it to implement? Uh, the truth is, it's not simple, uh, even though you hear about it everywhere. Uh, and we wanted to go through in this series of podcasts uh, called Fuse Bites some of the steps that are required to get AI ready. Uh, within your company. And among those is getting data ready uh, because you can't have uh, AI without high quality data. It's the fuel that really drives the AI algorithms. And if you don't have uh, high quality data, you've got garbage in, garbage out, uh, the old saying. Uh, so how do we set up AI models and algorithms for success when thinking about data? And how is data for AI different than data we've worked with for the past you know, 10, 15, 20 years uh, you know, since the big data boom uh, that happened um, and was being used for data analytics purposes uh, on the predictive analytics and then into prescriptive analytics. Uh, here we are now sitting around prescriptive analytics with AI and how is that data different? Well, I'm excited to bring a guest to the table here today. A gentleman named Scott Taylor uh, is joining me today. Hi, Scott. Nate, how are you doing? Great to see you. Thanks for having me. It's great to see you again. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm thrilled to have Scott on the show. Scott Taylor is known as the data whisperer. Uh, he's helped countless companies by enlightening business executives to the strategic value of proper data management. As an avid business evangelist, he focuses on business alignment and the strategic why rather than the system implementation and the technical how. He shares his passion through all forms of thought leadership content, including public speaking, blogs, videos, podcasts, white papers, and believe it or not, even cartoons and puppet shows, one of which I watched last night with their chief dog officer. Accolades and recognition include Data IQ 100. Uh, he's listed by CDO Magazine as a leading data consultant. Analytica, who's who in data management. Dataversity top 10 blogger and a Thinker360 uh, top 10 thought leader. He's written the book that I encourage you all to get called Telling Your Data Story. Data Storytelling for Data Management. Again, that's telling your data story, data storing for data, data storytelling for data management. It's available now. Uh, Scott lives in Bridgeport, Connecticut, where he often kayaks in Black Rock Harbor. And for those that want to know, he can also juggle pins and blow a square bubble. Uh, so welcome again here to the show, Scott. And how do you blow a square bubble? How do you blow a square bubble? Let's start from the bottom here. It's actually a bubble cube. And you blow six bubbles that are attached to each other. And then you put a straw in the middle. And when you blow there, the magic happens and a little cube appears. Imagine, imagine yes, that. Yes, it's spectacular. Yes. I saw somebody do it once on TV and I went, I could do that. When I was a kid, I was like, I can figure that out. And Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, have you figured out the Rubik's Cube? No. My son is a great Rubik's Cuber, but I'm just a bubble cuber. Yeah. I uh, I was wondering about that as well. Um, well, listen, uh, we're really excited to have you on the show um, for this uh, program uh, where we're focused on the, the the importance of data in the equation of AI readiness for companies. And nobody knows data better than you and, you know, the work that you've done in, um, you know, helping to educate senior management in particular about the why of data and why it's important and why and, and the importance of application of that data, as opposed to just getting stuck in the technical jargon uh, that many people get stuck in. And I think your data puppets uh, example uh, that you've got on YouTube that has 22,000 uh, views uh, is a good example of um, a bunch of puppets that are getting stuck in the jargon uh, and missing the why of it all. Um, so, you know, how did you become the data whisperer and get into this focus on, you know, uh, consulting to senior management about the why of data? I've always been a storyteller. Data storytelling now is a super hot thing, but I've been in storytelling since it was two words. And I go back in data pre 2K. So I've got decades of exposure to what I saw as common challenges, similar issues, common goals, enterprises at the level that you and I deal with all kind of are this. They're certainly more the same than they are different. 
when it comes to some of the issues that they face with enterprise data and enterprise data management. The data whisperer moniker was just something that hit me one day, you know, kind of like the dog whisperer, or the horse whisperer, <laughs> being in data management, we calm data down, we train data, we make sure data is acceptable and can be used. So it was a little bit tongue in cheek. I put it on a badge once at a conference and I got so much positive feedback. I, I never took it off again. So, well, but was... spoiler alert, even though I'm the data whisperer, I don't do a lot of whispering. I'm out there yelling, telling, and selling about the power and value of proper data management. And you can't yell and tell and sell that any louder or stronger these days, given the deluge of AI and gen AI and the hype cycle we're in, which is unlike anything I've ever seen. And I've seen a lot of it. It really is uh, a hype cycle like none other. I mean, I thought the big data hype cycle was uh, was extreme uh, back when we went through that in the mid 2010s. Uh, and this really just blows that out of proportion. It has everybody talking about it everywhere. You can't turn on CNBC, for instance, without coming across uh, something related to AI uh, or generative AI. Uh, you know, NVIDIA is all over the place as, you know, the most valuable company uh, out there on, in terms of market cap um, at times. And uh, so it's it's something that I, I've never experienced anything as big as what we're going through right now as well. Um, you know, I'm wondering, how do you think data is changing with the world of AI? Um, you know, we've we've got data. Uh, we've been using data. We've been using big data for years um, for analytics purposes, organizations, um, you know, navigate their analytics journey of descriptive analytics to diagnostic analytics uh, to predictive analytics to prescriptive analytics, and they're used. They've been using data to do that for years. In comes AI, which allows for a lot of fast tracking of things. It seems. Um, how does that disrupt the world of data management? Um, and how should we be thinking about refining our approach to data management in a world of AI? It just reinforces the need for proper data management, formal data governance, data structure, data foundation, whatever you want to call it. I like to call it where data starts versus where it ends up, which are things like AI and analytics and business intelligence and whatever the flavor of the week is. But you can boil my entire data philosophy down to three words. And as a storyteller, it's important to be succinct and try and get things down to a crisp level, especially for business executives that have don't have time to hear about data. But my three-word data philosophy is truth before meaning. You have to determine the truth in your data before you derive meaning. It is not chicken or egg here. It is egg and omelet. If you don't have the truth in your data, you're not going to get the meaning out of it that you expect. And that hasn't changed. I yeah. haven't found a way that that's changed. It's more important now. The scale of AI and generative AI are you know, staggering compared to what we looked at when we were just dealing with things like implementing enterprise systems and spreadsheets and basic business intelligence. But the fundamentals are the same, and that's part of what I try to point out. Even though the, it's glossier and frothier and sexier and hotter and more spectacular and kids know about it and everybody's using it, the, the fundamental aspects of it are the same. You mentioned GIGO in your intro there. I feel like that we learned that on the first day of data, right? Garbage yeah. in, garbage in. It's as sure as gravity. What goes up, what co must come down, and what goes in must come out. Yep. But it's it reinforces what I like to call the golden rule of data, which is do unto your data as you would have it do unto you, because uh -huh. what you're going to put into it is what you're going to get out of it. And for some reason, 30 years in this space, I still have to pound that message as strongly as, as ever. So it seems that... Um... You know, you, you're you're a big proponent of really focusing on the why, as opposed to the how, um, and it seems that the why is changing, um, because the needs of that data are changing. So why we have that data and what we're doing with it is changing in the world of AI. Uh, from where we were before and uh, helping accelerate, you know, predictive and prescriptive analytics as well as everything else that it's doing. How do you? advise uh, senior management in companies that you go into or talk with at conferences 
um, about how that why is changing uh, around that? And what is the reception that you tend to get from those executives that you speak with? I don't know if the why is really changing as much as maybe it appears. The stakes are different. The speed is different. The scale is different. The expense is different. The players are a lot more. The effects can be much more wide, widespread. But the essence of the why is my based on my belief that every company is trying to provide value to their relationships through their brands at scale. That's what they want to do. Generative AI makes that scale a lot more exciting and a lot more expandable, but it's still the same thing. At it again, at its essence, boil it down. So the why that I reinforce is why does what you want to do with data fill in the blanks as to what the current hype cycle is telling you? Why does that enable the strategic intentions of your enterprise? Where is your company going and why does data help you get there? And taking that apart at an organization, I look at two basic buckets. If you go back to that statement, providing value to relationships through your brands at scale, relationships, every company has relationships. You don't have relationships. You don't have a business. Right. The data about those relationships is as critical as any data you've got. And then every company has brands, products, services, offerings, whatever they might be. Yep. But that's how they provide that value to those relationships. And that keeps me really steady in an exercise I do, which is anything new that comes up, I find where that is. Where's the truth before meaning hook? Where's the foundational need? Where's the reinforcement of providing value to relationships through their brands at scale. So I tend to be the one just kind of, I'm not a trends guy, so I don't look up at what's new, but I wait till what's new shows up. And then I go, okay, how do I fit this into what I see are inextricable, undeniable laws of data in an enterprise? So that, that's that's really interesting. Uh, and I and I love when you talk about storytelling uh, as well. And your your book uh, really focuses on data storytelling and data management. I, I wonder, you know, over the past year and a half, what are some of the new stories that have emerged uh, that you find yourself uh, talking about um, at uh, these conferences, uh, in your blogs, uh, in your consulting opportunities with these uh, executives? You know, what are some of those key stories that are emerging? Um, you know, I saw the data puppets was one that was focusing on, uh, you know, the chief dog officer instead of the chief data officer arguing with the chief information officer and all of them, you know, forgetting the fact that the monthly reports weren't even working. Um, so they they were they were caught up in all the jargon and, and things like that. Um, how would you and, and I think that that was created about two years ago, um, if I if memory serves me correctly. Yeah, a couple years uh, ago, yeah. If you were to create data puppets for today um, and with an AI slant with all of the stories that you've seen and are emerging, you know, what might that look like today? It, it Again, I, it, it doesn't look so different. I do have another, an updated data puppet. I'm working on an epic multi-part series with the data puppets. If anybody's interested in finding them, just simply Google the term data puppet. <laughs> That's it. Well, I, I have on. They're they're great because they simplify you know some of the main things into a story that people can understand. Uh, the, 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 the most common feedback I get is that's just like my company. I was just in that conversation, and you're talking about a monkey and a bee and a dog and a cat, and they're arguing, and they are <laughs> literal hand puppets. And it seems to strike a chord with folks because the chief CDO, the chief dog officer. He's struggling to convince and, and manage data in his organization. He's just being bombarded with every type of, of problem that people show up with. In the latest one, it's a preview of this multi-part series called Journey to the Center of the Single Version of the Truth. And he meets up with a cat sultan from Meow Kinsey who only wants to buy more software. He meets up with a couple of software vendors, Sales Fork and Micro Spoon. And so there's a little <laughs> culinary utensil theme in there. There's a puppy intern that only wants snacks, so he doesn't care about what work he's doing. And then he runs off to go work at ARF b, &B. So it's definitely full of, infused with dad jokes in the data space, <laughs> but definitely 
resonates with folks. And you just mentioned, if you don't mind, I, this is my book, so everybody knows what it is. As mentioned, telling your data story, data storytelling for data management, 99% buzzword free. I didn't want to overpromise. And it takes people through this, I still think a very common journey of how to explain why telling a story about your data's importance is as critical as ever. I joked with my publisher to just update. It was written during COVID, so it came out at the end of 2020. And I joked, I was like, okay, we could update this. I'll just throw Gen AI in there every third paragraph, and it's still the same thing. Yeah. I think that would I think that would decrease the buzzword free count, however. But it it you know, the new stories that people are telling are just, I think they're just more enhanced, they're a little more urgent, they're a little more concerned. They're they see this double-edged sword of with Gen AI, data can literally run away from you in ways that it hasn't before, where you couldn't contain it. And a lot of po folks are still struggling with that. But you look at, you know, Gen AI came out and everybody was, oh, wow, this is fantastic. And all of a sudden, not too much longer after that, they started talking about the need for a proper training corpus. We need AI governance, which just doesn't cover the models, but it covers the inputs. This is a common story. You go from Gen AI all the way back to general ledger when people were said, we need a chart of accounts and you're yep. going to find these common themes in there. One of the things that we think about with big data and LLMs is, you know, concern about bias in the data, uh, concern about the sensitivity of data that you're using to train those models also getting out. How do you think about that in the concept of the storytelling that you do with senior management about the why of the data, you know, as it relates to concerns that, you know, they hear about, the board hears about, oh, I should be concerned about bias in my data, so I don't want to adopt AI. If you find the truth in that data, and when I say truth, I don't mean anything philosophical or political, you can really structure data around, let's say, your customer file, your customer hierarchies, your product categories, your product distribution, the fundamental piece parts of your business. When you have that really squared away and in a shape that people are confident that they can believe in it, that should do a lot to influence the lack of bias um, in whatever result you're getting. The security part, I'm not a security expert, so you right. need system folks to put that in there. But getting too far off of the truth of what you're trying to find meaning in starts to happen when you have things as simple as conflicting hierarchies or lots of duplicates in your relationship data or hierarchies that don't make sense or geographies where people have different definitions an exercise I used to take people through is, okay, how do you define Chicago? And you've got media markets and scanner markets and sales markets and measurement markets, lots of different configurations of something that's called the same thing. And that, along my theme of problems that have always been there, but that's exacerbated if you start to put these LLMs on top of it who may pick the wrong one without knowing. So I think a lot of it still comes back to some form of data governance, some form of data management, some form of stewardship, some form of agreement around the organization about standards. Everybody knows what a standard is. Standards work all across organizations and industries and markets. Yeah. And so that concept for me helps explain why it's important to invest in this. And the why that I focus on is why should the business care? Why should the business care about the work you're trying to do in data management? Why should they care so much that they can give you money that they could spend on things that frankly appear and end up being more tangible usually than data management, data stewardship, and so on. So it gets back to that starting off the right way. So you, you've mentioned today uh, both data governance, um, you've mentioned AI governance, do you see the two of them uh, working together um, or do you think that they're distinct um, entities within a company uh, in terms of how they should be handled? Uh, should they be, you know, as uh, you know, one in the same, uh, in your opinion, or do you think that they do uh, they do need to operate independently? I think that to be as 
close together as possible. The scope of them, I think the scope of what AI governance is still in discussion and being defined, but AI governance certainly includes the inputs as well as the models and probably the distribution and a few other things, but they've got to be as close together as possible. I always struggle when data science was really hot and people kept talking about how data scientists spend 80% of their time munging and wrangling data. And then the joke was they spend the other 20% complaining about munging and wrangling data. But it struck me and I asked around and it seemed to be true. You know, why aren't the data science, why isn't that team talking to the data governance team who knows the data management team, who knows where a lot of that data is, who knows which data is good and which isn't, who can probably help you avoid some munging and wrangling. So there's this bifurcation in the data space, if you will, between the folks who manage the data and the folks who use the data, between data management and business intelligence and analytics, there's always been this separation that for me is extremely frustrating. And I hope that AI governance doesn't get too far away and becomes its own department versus data governance, because these things are so, I think, inextricably linked. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I rode that curve there with the data scientists through the 80% problem of data wrangling uh, and the 20% uh, of complaining. Uh, and I see the same thing emerging to a degree with AI. Uh, you know, data science has really uh, evolved to a degree into AI. Uh, and it's the data scientists that were kind of at the leading edge of tackling the new AI algorithms and, you know, have become the AI engineers in many cases uh, that we see today. But the AI engineers are often left to themselves, uh, separate from the data engineers, let's say. Um, and so, you know, that's a common pattern that I see in companies uh, that those two are really distinct and the AI engineers end up doing their own data annotation. Uh, they end up doing their own um, data wrangling, uh, their own ETL work in some cases, because they're not connecting those dots that you talked about. And I think that, you know, for a company to be AI ready, it really is important that we fuse those things together um, so that they can be more seamless um, and you know work together. But what does that mean in terms of governance? I think you know it, it is up in the air, in my opinion, still around AI governance, uh, like you said. So I agree with you on that too. Um, what are some of the- I know you're into fusing, so that's good. As a, yes, as a, fusing as a with method. machines. <laughs> fusing with machines over here at Fuse Bytes. Yes. Um, so you know what are you, you speak about some of the fundamentals that people know. What what are some of the fundamentals of data governance that you think need to be in place for any company um, that is looking looking to tackle the data problem and the why of data governance uh, head on uh, and re recognizing that it is supportive of both traditional analytics as well as AI. You know what would you advise companies to put in place with data governance? so that they don't end up with the chief dog officer problem where they're just talking about buzzwords and not actually getting anything done. Not speaking as an organizational expert, but just as somebody who lives in the space for as long as I have, data governance needs to be able to tell the story of why it's an important part of the organization and provides horizontal value across everything an organization does. And when I define gov data governance, I'm going to split the hairs between data governance, data management, data stewardship, data quality. These are all parts of that high level, the phylum level, if you will, of yeah. data management versus business intelligence. And both of those tend to roll up into just a thing called data or data and analytics. Yep. And data management it also includes pipelines, data observability, things that don't have to do with quality. But for me, to simplify it, I just say, okay, two big buckets here, getting the data ready where data starts and using the data, you know, where data ends up. And that seems to, you know, there's a little bit of a gray area in between, but the big things happen on both sides. And so making sure you align those efforts and get the stakeholder engagement, get the C-level attention, getting in the room somewhere when a lot of these big ideas are happening that are technology-based, that's the clue. If they're going to use technology in your organization, there's going to be 
hardware, there's going to be software, and there's going to be data. And if there's data, there's going to be data management. So trying to make sure you get into those rooms where it happens is critical. And it's still a challenge because data governance, data management, that whole bucket tends to be relatively boring. It's never really sexy. It's clerical. It's back office. It's you know, things like MDM and reference data management sound like that, that they've been around for a long time. Are those really thrilling? You know, we want to do Gen AI. But when people say that, it's like, oh, I want to do Gen AI, but I don't care about data management. That's like saying, I want to have a great meal, but I don't care about the ingredients. Now, you can get somebody to cook the ingredients, cook the meal for you, but you hope that they care about the ingredients. Food is one of my favorite analogy sets to use when you get into the data management space because everybody's got to eat and it's relatable to everyone. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to the fork and the spoon analogies uh, coming out with your next puppet. Yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, it for me, it's really just important to keep pounding that message. And a lot of the work, the reason I wrote my book and the reason I do a lot of the work I do is because I had met so many data leaders on more on focused on the data management side who had this dual emotional state where they were really passionate and devoted around what they believed data could do for their organization, but they're really frustrated because people didn't listen to them. Yeah. Well, and why do you think that is that people didn't listen to them? How, how, how were they not successful in getting through? They tell a terrible story. They explain it with, and this is the same for all the, I'll, I'll throw this cast across all data, most data people, if you will, they love to start with how they did it. Okay, first we did this, then we tried this, then that didn't work, so then we tried this. And you know, we've got the latest that, and then these guys came in and showed us that this will be even better, and you've lost them already. They don't care. They don't tell a story, but don't tell your life story. I don't need to start with, you know, I started off as a child and then I grew up. You gotta get to the <laughs> point. And the story you tell about data, when I present data storytelling, the type of story it is, is a pitch. It really is. And it's a sales pitch. I got no problem with selling. I'm fourth generation sales and proud of it. Selling is the way to convince somebody of the benefits of what you have to offer. It makes things happen. So all the good parts of selling, I think people should really focus on. But you need to be able to, to get somebody to say, yes, that's what you want, right? You want them to go from, I have no idea what you're talking about, to how do we live without this? Yeah, I, I I think that's really a, a great point. Um, so the blend of data, if if data were a big mixer bowl, uh, you know, in your food analogies, um, you've got your first party data, uh, sometimes your second party data, and then oftentimes uh, you've got third party data. How do you think about, um, you know, when you start to blend those data sources together, um, different ways that you have to treat those different types of data, first party, second party, third party data sources. Um, do, you, do you think about those in different ways? Do you think that they need to be treated in a different way as you're, go as you're going through the governance process so that you can ensure higher quality for things that you may not be as in control of, like third party data? Uh, because first party data, it's entirely your responsibility right. uh, to get that right. Second party data, uh, you've got a little bit more control over third party data. You're getting what you're getting. Uh, and you, as my wife likes to say, you get what you get and you don't get upset right. uh, with uh, with these things. And uh, so how do you think that translates into data governance relevance and you know, ultimately into that data feeding these AI algorithms so that an organization can be AI ready? I worked, I cut my whole career was based on representing third party data sources as they would probably be categorized now. So 15 years at Nielsen, I was at Dun & Bradstreet, I consulted for Kantar, WPP, these world-class iconic data providers who provided content to enterprises to enrich and enhance and structure the internal data they had. This was before the parties started to to, to get identified, but it's, again, it's, it's, if it's not exactly the same, it's certainly more of the same than different than different in today's world. So you've got that first party data, which, you know, your master data reference data, your internal, highly structured, well-governed, expertly stewarded source of 
truth in whatever configuration fashion you can make it happen but you got to set that standard in your organization and nobody's ever convinced me that you can't they've convinced me that they can't get it done (laughs) but they haven't convinced me that they shouldn't do it right when i was at third party suppliers a lot of what the parts of the business I was in actually were the ones that help people align and integrate and standardize their data with our external data. So Nielsen had a set of store records, grocery store records. We found a way to use a unique identifier on these records to map it to the internal customer masters of these consumer packaging goods companies. So they, you know, everybody who sells something that goes into uh, somebody's kitchen or bathroom or house at any of the you know, grocery stores, supermarkets, mass merchandisers, and so on, you know, all those suppliers have a different version of that store record. And they're trying to integrate disparate data sources around either a store or an account or a market or some, one of these different dimensions. Yeah. And so that alignment I worked on helping people syndicate their deliverables so they could integrate more seamlessly with internal data of the client side on the enterprise side. It was always, it was, it was fascinating. I loved that. I mean, that's where I started and I've always loved that part of the space because again, those challenges, the scope of them are much bigger. The scale is huge. The speed's incredible, but the challenge is still inherently the same. You got lots of columns of data. You got to line them to the rows. Columns yeah. are easy to add. Rows are hard. So you, anybody who's tried well, to bang problem, two spreadsheets the, together. Yeah, the, the problem that. comes in the rows with bad data. Um, yeah, if and, the rows are bad, then the, then the columns don't mean anything. It's like the rows are master data. The columns are analytics so, in so a very how simplistic you, way. How do you, uh, you, you talk about trust, right? How do you evaluate the trustworthiness of third-party data as you're allowing for it to enter your system? Uh, I've been, you know, more on the recipient side of third-party data sources in my career uh, rather than on the supplier side. Um, and so, you know, I, I've seen those bad rows coming in. And, you know, I wonder how you think about evaluating the trustworthiness of that data from the perspective of a company that is ingesting it and merging it in the grand mixing bowl uh, that they've got in their kitchen. I, everything, there's more third-party data sources now than ever before. There's probably more now than there were when we started this podcast. And everybody <laughs> thinks their stuff is, you know, absolutely fantastic. This is it. High quality. Well, you know, this is going to give you the insight you need. When you're an enterprise thinking about it, I think you want to think about a couple of areas. Coverage. Structure. And it connect. even before you think of quality, it's like, this is cover my business. Is this, whatever this source is, is it about something that I care about? And is there enough of it? Does the scope of whatever this syndicated data provider has, does it cover enough of my business? If you get the most incredible, fantastic data about three census tracts or a couple of block groups or really are sort of, unique situation that's great for a proof of concept but i can't run i can't put that in product i can't run my whole business off that i can't have sure. my national sales force getting insight that's going to help them develop customer relationships if i only have like this little piece of it so understanding that coverage again i like worked at dun and bradstreet they have i don't know half a billion records nobody needs all of it Right. right. So they don't, you know, so it was that, that kind of discussion. Then you want to get into some form of structure, understand the structure of that data that you're getting. Does it have a unique identifier that you could map to yours? As simple as that, that hasn't gone away. People haven't figured out, Oh, we don't need unique identifiers. <laughs> they, but those tend to have to connect somehow. And what, at what level, what level of the hierarchy can go into things like products and retailers are simple organizations are easier to describe than consumer data or people data. Yeah. But organizational data, they may have a branch, they may have a 
regional headquarters. They may have a parent office in a country. They may have a global ultimate parent. What level do you even work at? What meaning and on the enterprise side, which of those levels are important to you? It could be a, on a product a brand information, it could be a skew, it could be all the way up to, you know, a brand franchise or a global brand. You know, if you look at Coca-Cola, it's a global brand name, but then it splits up into flavors and sure. it goes all the way down to the SKU level of, is it a bottle, is it a can, is it a six ounce, is it a 12 ounce? You know, those all are either really meaningful or completely worthless depending on the situation. So coverage, connectability, structure, and then you get into things like quality. Yep. And for me, quality is when I counsel people even on the enterprise side to sell a data governance program, I beg them not to lead with quality. Quality is a really emotional, subjective term. Everybody's got a different definition of quality. You could give data to somebody and they find two mistakes in a million records. And those two mistakes are things that are really close to them for some reason. And they think the whole file is a is is garbage so right it's there's lots of bigger deeper thinkers into how to assess quality and it's important but for me getting back to what i do every day which is help people sell this stuff in don't lead with that and and the proof that it doesn't work to lead with that is we've been talking about it for decades and we still have challenges convincing people it's important yeah. to invest in. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to say bad quality is a good idea, but also no CEO in their annual report letter to their shareholders is going to write about how next year's significant initiative includes better data quality. Yeah. How, so, so, how, I guess the yeah, key so how do you map those two things? You know, you got to connect that. So Yeah. And, and how do you connect it to the ROI? Right. So I connect it that way and go, okay, read the rest of that CEO letter, watch the rest of that presentation from your senior leadership that they did on investor day, watch their interview on CNBC, listen to your analyst calls. If you're a public company, find out what their question Hear, hear that. What's your strategy day? What's your company vision? You're going to find the hints in there. You're going to hear about relationships we want to be the premier partner of choice for our customers. We want to expand to different sectors. We need to um, find deeper, valuable ways to bring value to our relationships to our brands at scale. You know, different versions of it. It's going to be in there. Yeah, and there's going to be something. And, and the way they're going to do it, they're going to talk about their they're going to talk about their products and their brands and their services. So listen to those things and all that high level strategic stuff. It's your job at the organization to connect it with the data work you have to do. Yep. And uh, to demonstrate that uh, through business outcome based solutions. You know, one of the things that I like to say is that you've got to focus on, you know, the corporate North Star. What is it that we even care about data for? What are we trying to accomplish? And then what are the business questions that you have to ask on the ladder? Uh, and it's a ladder of business questions that you have to ask to get to that corporate North Star. Um, you know, questions beget questions. And so these ladders form uh, that you're trying to achieve. And those business questions themselves can become use cases that can then be implemented with data governance, with analytics, with artificial intelligence as well, in order to satisfy answers to those business questions. Um, and so I like to lead with that business question-based outcome um, that you're trying to achieve so that it's clearly tied to something tangible that the organization cares about and isn't just doing, you know, technology for technology's sake and because it's the next big thing from a technology perspective. Another very tactical, but very impactful approach is making sure you've got examples of really horrible data that the work you are proposing is going to help fix because people don't always see the stuff behind the scenes. Yeah. I, but really early in my career was in this sales organization presenting to them. And the head of sales just goes, Scott, you know, we can slice and dice our data any way we want to. All I have to do is push a button. And this really courageous data analyst at the end of the table just raises his hand. It's like, sir, I'm the button. You know, people have to <laughs> deal with that pain. The data munging that goes on. A data munging, oh. data brand, whatever it is. And I have a slide in my presentation that I use always 
and it's an example of 275 ways an organization spelled 7-Eleven. And it's just, people just, they love it. I tried for a while to not use it, but it's like one of my greatest hits. And the exciting thing is it's still relevant. People still get it. The depressing thing is it's still relevant. And people still need to see that because it's yeah. 30 years later. But find an example like that. I mean, there's a point where you got to rub their nose in it in the right way, in the right context. But you've got to show them where the pain is. you got to show them you have all these wonderful aspirations that are going to happen based on data. We get that. We know we can help you or based on Gen AI or whatever you want. But look at what we're dealing with. Back to your how do you trust it? Look at this mess. Does our... Salesforce even understand the concept of searching before they create another record. Is there any way we can help set standards? we got 22 places to create customer in our organization. These are not uncommon problems. And the bigger the enterprise, the worse it is. And the more an enterprise has grown by mergers and acquisitions, oh, yeah, the, yeah. The, the more it's like, you know, people start to give up in those kinds situations uh, i've yeah i've seen that firsthand and uh and you know we see it with customers uh, clients uh as as they're going through these data needs that they have to have solved it's oftentimes you know the the comments are you know the the data lake and data lake house are neither a data lake nor a data lake house nor a data warehouse uh it's just a bunch of crap uh and crap is the nice word um you know there's there's other yeah there's you know i was on a call earlier today talking about data and uh, the concept of uh, what we have at this company is a dumpster fire. Uh, and so it's, you know, this this realm of getting that in front of people that are decision makers to understand the implication of having a dumpster fire of data uh, so that you can make the business case for that. Because that dumpster fire is what you've got to train your AI models and you want to become an AI ready company. And so how do you make sure that you can do that? I think it comes back to the business case, uh, the business question that's being asked mapping that to the AI problem that you're trying to solve from an AI perspective saying, okay, what is the data that I need in order to solve this problem? And then tracking that back up and going through, you know, standards of uh, understanding what layers of governance are there around that data uh, and, you know, working it in that reverse engineering way and trying to take a look at the data that you need and understand the full data lifecycle management that data governance is responsible for, for that. Uh, before really jumping fully into creating the AI algorithms, assuming that the data is you know good enough to work with. Uh, you've got to really follow that pattern of tying it to business outcomes, focusing on the algorithms, asking yourself, what data do I need? Taking a look at the data, making sure that it's governed and understanding that, which gets back to what you were saying before about bringing together the AI engineering with the data governance much more closely so that that conversation can happen. It's going to happen somewhere. It's either going to happen and get solved or there's something's going to break later. That's going to be a big mess that they're going to have to piece apart and realize. Yeah. I mean, most of the time it's the data's problem. The right. data's fault, right? Yep. The software works, you know, software works, hardware, you know, do they have big hardware problems anymore? Right. Everybody's got cloud too to put plenty of storage, plenty. Of, so those kinds of other than little, you know, minor glitches is not what i'm talking about but usually the data was the problem it gave them the wrong answer it skewed it the wrong way there was bias in the data there was some kind of missing piece that people didn't see or multiple versions of the same thing or you know that tends to be more of the more of the issue so fixing all that stuff earlier getting your handle on it just getting into the conversation that this is part of it. I mean, yeah. that's all I'm really ever asking for. It's like, just get, as I said, get us in the room, make us part of it. I remember this when ERP and CRM were starting to roll out it was a big thing. And they would, you know, Siebel and SAP. And so these early brands that were in there and it just brought to light all these enterprises that would just you know buy new software everything demos beautifully because it's not your data in the demo and then they try to start that car up and the gas has got sand in it to push the analogy there's 
and and dealing with data people who were just like, I wish they let us know. Why didn't they put us in there? So yeah. the personification of some of this, I think, has come, which is a really good development, at least in the idea of a chief data officer, of somebody who is accountable for the data, not necessarily the technology. I'm mildly disappointed as the CDO titles have expanded to CDAO, CDAIOU, sometimes Y, O, whatever. Where do they just, you know, we get in our own way so much. Sure. In terms of some of this, I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I don't know how many C level spots there are that you could divide up a CDA, a CDO, a CAO, and a CAIO. I don't think there's a lot of companies who have that kind of room around the board table. Right, right. Yeah, I, I mean, I served as a chief data officer uh, prior to joining Fuse Machines, and it was, you know, for a company that uh, went through a big set of mergers and uh, had, uh, you know, an integration challenge that needed to be faced. Uh, and there was, you know, a strong need for an urgency around that. And I think that the titles derive from the, the urgency that's created within that company and what is core to that company at a given point in time. Uh, to really kind of uh, say this is the emphasis that we want to put on getting this right. Um, and in some cases, it might be a chief AI officer. Uh, it might be an AI-driven company uh, that uh, you know really needs that because that's core to their brand and it's part of their core competency that they're looking to uh, expand. Um, but uh, you know, I think there's often confusion about you know where should AI sit within a company? Should it sit under the chief data officer? Should it sit under the chief technology officer? Should it sit under a chief AI officer? Um, and you see it in different places at different companies. And I think that where it sits is based on uh, something that's growing organically over time, mostly, um, but uh, you know ends up being in the place that it can have the most impact within the business. I just look at it structurally and go, okay. Is there room for, I guess I'm mildly cynical on some of this, surprise, surprise. But it's like, you know, it's there's a CFO, but there's not a C-A-R-O and a C-A-P-O, right? right? It's just like, <laughs> there's a chief marketing officer, but there isn't a chief TV officer and a chief website officer. I mean, just at some point, you got to stop. And I just wonder how that sounds to the rest of the organization. Sure. So we live in a data bubble. And an exercise I encourage people to do is, is pretend you're a different part of the organization and say some of this stuff and see if it even makes sense at all. We spend yep. so much time in the data space pontificating around the existential concepts of how do we bring value and where's our value. I, I, I don't think other departments do that much. I don't think the finance department's wondering how it brings value to the business every day. Right or the marketing department. I just, they get it done. They have struggles, they have hype, they got buzzwords, they got craziness too. But there's just something around the data IT analytics space. Again, I feel like we get in our own way, a lot of way, times. And I think the way we talk about data is holding the industry back, which is one of my core concepts that I preach about all the time. Just talk about a business accessible way, get the work done, come up with the business reason, not the data reason. And part of that is communicating in a, in a way that people understand you. Yeah, it's the magic of the storytelling that has to happen. Yeah. That storytelling ha has to happen around the why as opposed to the how. Um, well, listen, Scott, we're approaching time here. Um, and uh, you know, I wanna thank you for uh, joining us on Fuse Bytes. Uh, I thought this was a really productive conversation. Uh, I thought your insights were really valuable. Um, you know, I heard uh, really great uh, sound bites as we went through, uh, you know, with really good tips and tricks that are in there. And I hope that, uh, you know, our executives that are listening to this program will take those, write those down and implement them in their own firms as they think about getting AI ready uh, and making sure that they're data ready so that they can be AI ready. Uh, but it's been really a pleasure having you today here, Scott. It's been great, Nate. Thanks for having me. This was fun. Time went right by. And again, people follow me on LinkedIn. I've got a YouTube channel where all my videos are. My book, Telling Your Data Stories on Amazon. And uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn if you ever want to connect on anything. So thanks again, though. Thanks for having me. Sounds great. And thank you all to uh, those that are listening to this podcast. We really appreciate you. This is Fuse Bites, and I'm your host, Nate Rakowitz, and we'll see you on the, on the next episode.